So today, many traditions of the church, the Church of England included, celebrates Mary, the mother of Jesus. It is, of course, a particularly big festival for our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters. If you've ever been abroad at this time of year in places like Spain uh, or Italy, you would have been treated to big processions uh, in the villages. It's a big, big day. And in the Roman Catholic Church, it is an official doctrine that at the end of her life, Mary was taken up, body and soul, into heaven. It's an important day in the Orthodox traditions too, sometimes preceded by no less than 15 days of fasting. Though Orthodox beliefs about Mary's departure from this world are quite different, namely that like all of us mortals, Mary fell asleep in death. Personally, and I don't think I'm alone in this, I'm much more interested in how Mary lived rather than in how she died. This summer, we've been pursuing a sermon series called Christ-Centred and Jesus-Shaped, based on the Church of England's new vision for the 2020s. We've been taking a long, hard look at Jesus, as portrayed in the Gospels of Mark and John. But of course, one of the most important ways we get to know Jesus is by getting to know Mary. Mary was, after all, Jesus' mother. He shared in her humanity. He shared in her DNA. And so what I thought we could do today is to take a fresh look at that famous song of Mary's, which we call the Magnificat, and see what this song tells us about Mary and what, in turn, what this song might tell us about her son, Jesus the first thing we might notice about Mary's song is that it is very, very scriptural. As our first reading reminds us, Mary's song begins with reference to the prophets. In fact, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour is pretty much straight out of Isaiah. Mary's song begins with the prophets and ends with the patriarchs, recalling God's promises to Abraham and to Israel. Even at this point in her life as a young woman, Mary is clearly somebody who knows her Bible. But not only does she seem to know the Bible, she has a vision of how the scriptures apply to her own life and particularly to her impending motherhood of Jesus. Jesus, similarly, was someone soaked in the scriptures. In the Gospels, the, the, the scriptures are never far from Jesus' lips. In fact, many times he responds to all kinds of questions with the words, it is written, including that most awful time of temptation in the desert. Today, we live in a very different world from Mary and Jesus. There are so many different texts, so many different messages calling for our attention through so many different media. But in the midst of all these different messages, the question remains, how much time, how much space do I create in my own life for the words of God to truly sink in and become core to who I am? just as they were clearly core to the identities of Mary and her son, Jesus. The second thing we might note about this song is it's a song of humility. Notice how Mary begins, yes, by singing about herself, but it's not long before she has turned her attention fully to God. Don't get me wrong, there's no false modesty here. Mary seems to know only too full well, only too well that her, her name is going to go down in history. Surely from now on, she sings, all generations will call me blessed. But at the same time, she seems to know her true place before God, which is what humility is. 
She calls herself lowly. She describes herself as God's servant. And her innermost being wants to magnify God. To magnify something is to make something bigger. She wants to proclaim God's true greatness and majesty and power. One of the most groundbreaking books of the 20th century, you may have read it, was J.B. Phillips' Your God is Too Small. I do recommend it. But I don't think that was a problem for Mary. In her song, throughout the Gospels, and indeed in many icons, she is the one who points the way. She is the hodigitria. Uh, that's Greek for the one who points the way. And there she is pointing to Jesus. We see her in that pose so often. And we see her in that pose in so many of the gospel stories. She is constantly pointing away from herself and pointing towards God, including, of course, God uniquely dwelling in her own son. And Jesus himself carries on in this spirit of humility. He constantly points people to God the Father, to God the Spirit, and to the kingdom of God. So how about you and how about me? How big is our God? To what extent am I or is God center of my universe? To what extent do I point away from myself? to God and all of his greatness. Thirdly and finally, we cannot help but notice what is often called God's bias for the poor. Mary's song is clear. God is merciful to the poor in spirit. He lifts up the lowly. He feeds the hungry. But the proud, they are scattered. The powerful, they are brought down from their thrones. The rich, they are sent away empty. This is God's topsy-turvy kingdom, which her son Jesus went on to preach, for example, in the Beatitudes, but also to live out, spending most of his time with characters like tax collectors, prostitutes, lepers, outcasts of all kinds. God comes to earth in Mary's son. And where does he hang out? Not in palaces, not in places of wealth or power or influence. This is God's bias for the poor and the marginalized. God's bias for the little people. On this special day, as we celebrate Mary, the mother of God, I can't help thinking, and maybe this is the case for you as well, I can't help thinking about another mother, Maxine Davison, gunned down by her son, Jake, in Keyham, Plymouth, on Thursday evening, along with six others in the neighbourhood, either killed or seriously injured the worst mass shooting in the UK for over a decade. It heartens me to hear that it was a local church that organised a vigil service to help locals cope with the horror and the tragedy. Yes, Mother Church should always be there in times like that. And I don't know Kiam well, but from the pictures I've seen, it looks like a very ordinary place with very ordinary people. It doesn't look a particularly wealthy place. It doesn't look like a particularly influential place. But the good news of Mary and of her son Jesus is that you don't need to be rich or powerful to earn God's favor. In fact, quite the reverse. If you are one of the little people, God is especially on your side. In Jesus, God came not just to help the little people. He became one of the little people. 
But the real tragedy of Kiam is that somebody like Jake Davison, in his state of feeling utterly powerless and marginalized and spurned and betrayed and insignificant, apparently didn't realize that God was especially on his side. How tragic. We all need to know that God is on our side, but if the tragedy of Kiam is not to be repeated, the likes of Jake Davison need to know God's bias for the poor, for the marginalized, for the betrayed, for the people on the sidelines. So if there's a Jake Davison in your life, make sure he or she knows about this bias of God's towards them. Reach out with God's love and friendship. Lift up the lowly. Feed the hungry. There's a joke by Shane Claiborne, the uh, Christian activist against poverty, that goes something like this. Um, a homeless guy trucks up at a very well-heeled uh, suburban church, He's pretty disheveled, he's pretty dirty, he brings all of his baggage with him, and he plonks himself in the front pew of the church. And afterwards, the pastor takes him aside and says, son, I want you to do something for me. Uh, if you're coming back next Sunday, I'd like you to pray to God, and I'd like you to ask God how you might dress in God's house appropriately on a Sunday. Well, the week went by and sure enough, the man came back next Sunday. He came back looking exactly the same, as dirty and disheveled as ever, still carrying all of his baggage with him. And the pastor actually cut, cuts him off at the door and says, well, what happened? Did you, did you pray to God? Did you pray to Jesus? Did you ask him how you might appropriately dress in God's house on a Sunday? And the, the homeless man replies, yes, I did. And Jesus replied, I don't know, because they never even let me in. So do we really want Jesus to be part of us here at St. Wilfrid's? Well, if so, according to Jesus... And according to Mary, his mother, let's do three things in particular. Let's make God's word an integral part of our lives. Secondly, let's magnify God and minimize our own egos. Thirdly, let's live out God's topsy-turvy revolution, whereby the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Amen.